Good afternoon, all, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association. I'm Grace Atherton, WCMA's Communications Director, and I'm so glad to have you with us today as we discuss the latest food safety research and regulatory updates related to the ongoing outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza, or H5N1, in U.S. dairy cows. Before we start, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, please make sure your mic is muted and your video is turned off to avoid interruptions during today's webinar. You can submit questions at any time in the chat uh, for addressing at our Q&A at the end. We do have some pre-submitted questions that we'll start with uh, during that portion, but if you have questions that come up during the presentation, please feel free to drop those in the chat and we'll do our best to address them. Finally, I want to remind you that a recording of today's webinar, along with a list of resources and contact information, will be shared with all registrants uh, before the end of this week. So please watch for that in your email inbox after the conclusion of this webinar. That email will come from me. With that, we'll take a quick look at our agenda before we dive in. We'll start with an H5N1 situation report delivered by uh, our staff here at WCMA. And then we'll move to uh, our main program, regulatory updates and food safety research related to H5N1 uh, from a, our wonderful expert guest speaker here, Dr. Stephen Gruby from FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. After that, we'll move to our Q&A session uh, before we finish before at or before 2 p.m. today. We'll get you out on time. So with that, I will turn things over to Rebecca Sweeney, uh, have her introduce herself and take it away. Thanks so much, Grace. And again, thanks to all of you joining us here today. We know that your time is valuable and it's difficult to get away from the VAT or away from meetings, um, but we also understand how critical this information is to you. So thank you for partnering with us uh, as we try to move through um, H5N1 outbreaks. My name is Rebecca Sweeney and I serve as Senior Director of Programs and Policy for the Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association. Ours is a national organization supporting dairy processors and their supplier partners coast to coast. Today's program is part of a series of free educational offerings we are bringing to you with the support from the Dairy Business Innovation Alliance. That's a program that's federally funded that we run in partnership with the Center for Dairy Research. That means that available now at wischeesemakers.org, you can find a one-hour webinar featuring experts from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on employee safety strategies around H5N1. We recorded that last week and we had a great attendance, but it's available to you now if you missed it. You just heard from Grace a little bit about what we're going to focus on today, uh, but we also wanna let you know that next week we'll host leaders from the US Department of Agriculture the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory, and the Farmer Wellness Center at the Wisconsin Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection uh, to focus on a, a workshop, an all-day workshop on enhanced biosecurity practices and how processors can support their farmer partners. We know that you are taking the threat of H5N1 seriously, and so are we. With that, let's take a moment for a situation report where we are today on this um, August 6th. Bird flu, of course, is not a new threat. It dates all the way back to 1878, but as viruses do, the bird flu has mutated over the years. And this particular strain, H5N1, first emerged in the fall of 2020 in Europe, but is now spread across six continents. You're looking at a heat map of sorts showing where we've seen the most significant animal impact. And you can notice the dark red in North America. Let's take a closer look at the timeline uh, of H5N1 outbreaks. Um, in November 2021, H5N1 was first detected in Canada in wild birds and poultry, with ducks harvested by hunters in North and South Carolina testing positive for the virus the following month. Then in early February 2022, a commercial turkey flock in Indiana tested positive, and reports across the country started coming in fast and furious after that. In April 2022, the first poultry worker in the U.S. tested positive for the virus that we know of, at least, and was treated with an antiviral drug and thankfully recovered well. No more human infections were reported at that time, but bird infections, of course, continued. And by February 2023, it was estimated that more than 50 million chickens were killed 
making this one of the largest bird flu outbreaks in recorded history. Throughout this period, a number of mammals were also recorded to have been infected. In fact, since 2022, USDA APHIS has reported H5N1 uh, viral detections in more than 200 mammals. That brings us to March of this year, when H5N1 was first detected in dairy cows in Texas and then in Kansas. Investigations show that the virus had been circulating since the previous, previous December, likely after introduction by a wild bird in a uh, Texas cattle farm. A month later, we saw a human infection detected, again, thankfully a mild case with the individual experiencing conjunctivitis. Importantly, though, this was the first reported cow to human transmission of H5N1 bird flu. Certainly, we know that the virus is highly transmissible from animal to animal. Since the first dairy infection reported in March, 178 dairy cow herds in 13 U.S. states have confirmed cases of H5N1, with 37 confirmed cases in just the past 30 days, the vast majority of which have happened in Colorado. Colorado is also a hot spot for the human spread of H5N1, with nine cases confirmed in just the past couple of weeks. All of those cases are associated with poultry farms. However, the recent uptick brings the total number of cases in the U.S. since uh, spring to 13, a number which does include dairy farm workers as well, part of the reason why we focused on employee safety practices in our previous webinar. Importantly, no human-to-human -human transmission has been recorded, and there have been no fatalities here in the United States. Uh, most cases that we know of, again, are very mild. With that said, there's also concern that cases are going unreported and that case numbers are continuing to rise. We're seeing lots and lots of news coverage on this. The focus is on trying to eradicate the disease before it might evolve again, perhaps into something that poses uh, even greater threat to human beings. Federal partners are leading the charge with the U.S. Department of Agriculture engaged in biosecurity planning and resources for farmers. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is recommending personal protective equipment or PPE and vaccination for the traditional flu to try to keep agricultural workers safe. They're engaging in educational campaigns with ads running on radio and social media, reaching millions of people in key parts of the country. And the agency is also leading surveillance work to date, uh, more than 4,300 people have been monitored as a result of their exposure to infected or potentially infected animals. And at least 230 people who have developed flu-like symptoms have been tested. The federal government is funding the development of a bird flu specific vaccine as well. Uh, and the US Food and Drug Administration continues its work testing dairy and other foods to ensure the safety of American consumers. That brings us to today's focus, FDA regulation and research into food safety amid H5N1 outbreaks. We are honored to welcome the nation's foremost expert on this topic, as Dr. Stephen Gruby, Chief Medical Officer for the FDA's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Dr. Gruby, we appreciate your time, understanding how many demands there are on it right now, and we thank you today for sharing your insights on this important topic. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks everybody uh, for, for inviting us to share updates on FDA's activities to help you keep the U.S. milk supply safe. As Rebecca said, I'm Steve Gruby. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for FDA's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, and currently serving as FDA's Incident Coordinator for the H5N1 response. Uh, I'm going to go on camera off, just so to, to say bandwidth, and I'm going to ask Grace to advance my slides. Next slide, please. As we get started, I wanted to highlight four key points. First, the evidence we have so far, all of the evidence we have so far, shows that the commercial pasteurized milk and dairy supply remains safe. Second, as we've not seen this virus in milk before, more work is needed to complete our knowledge around this emerging pathogen. Third, FDA recognizes how important it is to stop H5N1 in cattle and to keep it from spreading to other animals and humans. Fourth, FDA is taking a multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral approach to food safety and medical countermeasures. Next slide. To see us through to the other side of this event is going to require continued coordination across jurisdictions, sectors, and disciplines to bring the outbreak to a close. Just last month, we saw poultry and humans affected by H5N1, which based on the viral sequencing was likely passed to the poultry from cattle. 
The vast majority of cases have been in poultry so far, where over 100 million birds have died or been culled, followed by the number of, of cattle that have been affected. Uh, we're still trying to get a handle on the scope of that issue, and thankfully a relative handful in humans. The human cases have, so far, been quite mild, for which we are enormously thankful. We're also thankful that every human case is exposure to an infected animal or premises. Meeting this outbreak head on and stopping the cattle outbreak at the earliest possible moment is our best shot at keeping both of those being true. To do that is going to take all of us working together to protect human and animal health and to protect our industries across every level of government, across industries, processors, producers, retailers, everybody. Next slide. FDA is part of an overall U.S. government response that uses the Incident Command Group model, where agencies come together to coordinate plans and operations to tackle the problem together. Within FDA, we established an incident management group to coordinate the actions and engagement across the agency. From food safety to diagnostics to antivirals to vaccines, all of FDA has been mobilized to respond to the outbreak we have and to prepare for the outbreak that we could see if we can't bring this under control fast enough. Next slide. At the end of June, FDA announced our research agenda that outlines our efforts to, to help ensure the safety of milk and dairy supply products during this outbreak. Our agenda provided an overview of FDA's scientific efforts around understanding the characteristics of inactivation methods for H5N1 in dairy, ensuring the safety of retail dairy products, and mitigating the impact of the virus. As you can find outlined in the agenda online, FDA is working on a multitude of efforts to one, understand the characteristics of H5N1 inactivation methods in dairy products, two, ensure and verify the safety of retail dairy products, and three, mitigate the impact of this virus using a One Health approach. Our first objective was to understand the characteristics, oh, sorry, next slide. Our first objective was to understand the characteristics of inactivation methods for H5N1 in dairy products. Next slide. Determining that a thing happens, in this case, that none of the samples we've tested so far from commercial milk supplies have had viable H5N1, doesn't tell us why, and it doesn't tell us where our safety margins are. We've shown, based on our re initial research conducted on four uh, states back in April, that raw milk samples have had viable H5N1. Our retail samples that were released back in June show that milk pasteurized milk didn't the last time we looked. Part of our work is understanding how various amounts of virus, the individual steps in pasteurization, and changing pasteurization time and temperature parameters under real world conditions affect virus viability. Another part is ongoing validation that our existing processes remain effective at inactivating the virus as the situation evolves and that the commercial pasteurized milk supply remains safe and critically publicly sharing that message. Next slide. On June 28th, the FDA re released results from our first of its kind study using the process typically used by commercial milk processors. The intention of this study was to further confirm that pasteurization is effective in inactivating H5N1 in fluid milk and products made from fluid milk. The study, the only one to date designed to simulate commercial milk processing, found that the most commonly used pasteurization time and temperature requirements were completely effective at inactivating H5N1 in milk at levels far higher than the average we found in our initial raw milk sampling. We are planning additional research to look in depth at how different times and temperatures affect viral inactivation. Next slide. Once we had the results in hand from our pasteurization study, we're next looking to explore how sensitive this virus is to temperature. We're preparing for thermal inactivation kinetic studies to understand how much heat does it take to inactivate different amounts of virus and how long does it take to do so. This will hopefully help answer the question of what effect sub-pasteurization temperatures have on fire viability. There are no longer questions about whether pasteurization works against this virus. It does. Just like it does against the pathogens that we started pa pasteurizing milk for a century ago, so that really shouldn't surprise anyone. To better answer questions about whether H5N1 can survive in various products, we're first looking to, to research how how different steps of making different cheeses from pasteurized milk affect the amount of viable virus. One might expect that changes in salt, temperature, acidity, et cetera, used when making different products would affect survival. Just like with pasteurized milk, to know, you have to prove it. Uh, we know that other viruses like foot and mouth disease virus can survive some cheese making processes. So we're trying to answer the questions for this virus. Next slide. For our second objective, we want to make sure that what's being sold to consumers now is safe. 
to understand where any risks to human or animal health might be, and to pinpoint how to make sure that the commercial milk supply remains safe going forward. FDA is a science-based public health agency. It's not enough that we've had 100 years of experience to tell us that pasteurization works and that it works against a whole host of pathogens. We had to prove that it works against this virus, prove it to ourselves and to the American public. Next slide. In late May, FDA released the results of our initial retail product testing for H5N1. We tested 297 retail product samples in April that were collected from 17 states. These were pro produced at 132 processing locations in 38 states. As all of you are very aware, milk can be produced in one state, processed in another, and sold in yet a third. In this study, the samples were blinded to brand and retail location, and no traceback occurred to identify the state of origin. In 20% of the samples that we tested, FDA saw F H5N1 viral RNA fragments, but none of the samples that we tested had viable virus. I want to say that again. Despite testing 297 samples where 20% had some fragments of viral RNA, none of them had viable virus. Had we detected viable virus in a product, FDA would have been able to unblind the specimens, conduct an investigation, and take appropriate public health measures to protect American lives. So now we had real, real, real world proof, albeit in a single snapshot, that pasteurization was working. Next slide. In case anyone in the room hasn't been living this firsthand, we wanted to share how the current testing stream flows. After samples were received, we screened samples for H5N1 by quantitative PCR, which alerts us not only to the presence of H5N1, but how much was present. These samples ha uh, that have H5N1 were then inoculated into eggs for a virus variability test. Now, this allowed us to determine whether any of the ge genetic material we detected by PCR actually represented a potentially infectious virus. And again, none of the pasteurized products we've tested so far have had viable infectious virus. Next slide. FDA has begun a second sampling survey of retail dairy products uh, to expand our knowledge of H5N1 prevalence in dairy herds. Uh, these products are intended to address remaining geographic and product gaps from initial sampling of the commercial milk supply that we did in April and May. The second sampling survey is, is testing an expanded list of products, including aged raw milk cheeses, cream cheese, butter, and ice cream. Importantly, additional samples are being taken from areas included in our previous survey to help provide a more representative picture based on the level of dairy product production that occurs in different regions. Now, products from herds that weren't affected at the time of milking won't tell us much, except that the herds weren't, herds weren't affected at the time of milking. But every PCR positive product that tests, ne tests negative for viable virus adds to the body of knowledge about this virus. And we're hoping to be able to release the results of this second survey very soon, uh, we plan to continue monitoring products going forward to both gauge national prevalence and maintain consumer confidence in the commercial milk supply. Next slide. Our last objective gets at the heart of the matter, which is why it's first on the earlier slide. If we can help end the outbreak in dairy cows, we won't have to worry about whether pasteurization kills the virus because it won't be there. We won't have to worry about whether virus is going to change, become deadlier in cows or people because it won't be there. This outbreak starts and ends in the herds. Next slide. To that end, FDA is looking to establish animal and veterinary innovation centers as part of our commitment to encourage development of products to better support animal health and veterinary interventions. These centers will further FDA's plans to address critical unmet needs impacting animal and human health. One of those needs is research that supports the development of interventions to prevent, control, or eliminate H5 in animals. Another is interventions that reduce the circulation of the virus in the ecosystem. What can we do to reduce the amount of exposure and amount of spread? FDA also anticipates funding research on the disposable of non-saleable or waste milk that's taken from symptomatic cows. We don't want milk with live virus to be disposed of in such a way that it gets picked up by new species or gets into wild birds. This includes the use of different chemical compounds, such as acidifying agents, disinfectants, and enzymes to reduce H5N1 in raw waste milk. Given the different environmental laws across the states, uh, we plan to focus on environmentally friendly and readily available products to mitigate the virus and milk waste at the farm level uh, to make them easy to use and broadly applicable across the country. Next slide. Uh, we've proven that pasteurization inactivates H5 in, in, in the lab using real world conditions and real world equipment. We've proven through sampling fluid milk and dairy products at retail locations that pasteurization inactivates H5N1 in, H5 in the real world. 
We plan to explore how the virus behaves in cheese making and looking at other products to fill the gaps in our knowledge. As we learn more, we expect there'll be even more to learn. Uh, assuming we know everything is the surest way that something is gonna surprise us. Uh, by staying humble and looking for answers, we'll try to avoid those kinds of surprises. Next slide. In our June 6th letter to state regulatory partners regarding, H regarding H5N1 and intrastate raw milk, FDA made four recommendations. First, we recommended that states distribute messaging to the public about the health risks of consuming raw milk and raw milk products, including illnesses, miscarriages, stillbirths, kidney failure, and death. Second, we recommended that states monitor dairy cattle herds for signs of illness that would indicate inf infection with H5N1. Uh, FDA recommended that producers should continue to discard, raw mil uh, discard milk with suitable protocols from symptomatic cows, that any raw milk or raw milk products from exposed cattle that are fed to calves or other animals should be heat treated or pasteurized. Third, FDA recommended that states implement a surveillance testing program in their state to identify the presence of H5N1 in dairy herds that might be engaged in producing raw milk for interstate sale. For states that implement such a surveillance testing program, sharing data and testing results with dairy regulatory partners will allow for coordinated management of the virus. Lastly, for states that permit interstate raw milk sales, FDA recommended that states use their regulatory authorities or implement other measures as appropriate to stop the sale of raw milk that might present a risk to consumers. This might include restricting the introduction of raw milk that might contain viable H5 for human or animal consumption within a defined geographic area or within the state. If H5 n one is identified in a herd, there is a risk that viable virus could be present in raw milk from the herd, even when clinically, owls are, clinically cows are segregated. Next slide. Again, thank you for this opportunity and for your partnership in dealing with this, this evolving situation. Uh, I'd like to open it up for questions at this time. Terrific. Dr. Groovy, we're going to, um, in addition to the resources that you see on your screen right now, which is the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's uh, page for updates on HPA, I want to direct you to just a couple of other resources that continue to be updated through time, um, including uh, the following website. So WCMA provides a host of dairy-specific information and fact sheets on our website, with cheesemakers.org. The CDC, the FDA, and the USDA all have easy to read information online. Um, and helpfully on every page, you'll see when it was last updated. And I can tell you that in, as a person who checks them every single day, it looks like they're updated every single day. We're learning more all the time. And for those of you who are in Wisconsin, the Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection is offering industry resources online and points to an online form uh, that is available through the Department of Health Services so that you as dairy processors may apply right now for free personal protective equipment for your employees. If you have other needs, let WCMA know and we'll take action. Perhaps we'll learn about some of those needs now as we move into the live question and answer portion of our program. We did, as Grace noted earlier in our program, have a few questions pre-submitted. And Dr. Gruby, we're going to start with our first one right now. That is, do you believe that, and we just heard you say that FDA is currently engaged in that second round of retail product testing. Do you believe that FDA will engage in additional future testing of dairy products off grocery shelves? Do you see FDA engaging in the testing of products that are destined for food service as well? Of course, our industry uh, serves many and many of those products do go to uh, retail grocery stores, but uh, much of our product is also going into food service. Thanks, Rebecca. So again, we do anticipate additional uh, future testing of dairy products. Uh, where that testing occurs, uh, we're still investigating where the best place would be. Uh, what we would like to do is to make sure that we have a sustainable program that addresses uh, the, the need to a, uh, make sure that, that consumer confidence remains high and B, that viable virus doesn't enter the food supply. So we're looking at what does that need to look like going forward? And as soon as we have a definitive answer, we'll be sure to share that. Okay, thank you, doctor. Our next question, do we know if viral load is higher uh, if a person consumes affected raw milk or if it is respirated? So uh, could be inhaled or enters the body through the eye, some other way. Um, do we know anything about that at this point and, and the risk that that might pose to a human being? So the, the viral load is really a function of how much virus is in the substance the person comes into contact with and then how much they're in contact with. 
And so most of the time when we talk about flu, we're for the most part talking about virus that uh, affects the respiratory system. Um, that's how most of us get the flu. We're still looking at how do you understand how much virus a person consumes and then what does the effect does the respiratory tract versus the, the, the digestive tract have on the virus's ability to infect the body. So it's, it's a question of how is it easier to become infected? Uh, we don't typically aspirate or, or you know, have aerosolized milk in our, in our lungs. So it's less likely that you're gonna be exposed to milk via the, the respiratory route. Uh, there's a question of people who have uh, difference, differences of functionality in the respiratory tract. Uh, for the most part, again, we're, we're mostly worried at, at the farm worker level about aerosolized milk. Uh, again, we've seen people, uh, four people, I think, in the United States so far uh, who've been in contact with affected dairy herds who, who've come and uh, developed H5N1. And then nine people recently have been affected uh, after being exposed to poultry depopulation operations. So those are different kinds of exposure. And we're right now still looking to see what is the risk and how much do you need to be exposed to, to develop an infection? A lot of questions still in a, a developing situation. Of course, for dairy processors, note that uh, no dairy processing worker has yet tested positive for H5N1 infection. However, your um, dairy haulers, your milk haulers, and anyone that works at a pre-pasteurization step in your processing plant also has that possibility of aerosol, uh, aerosolized uh, raw milk. So important to pay attention, whether it is uh, farm worker guidance or anyone that's working pre-pasteurization in your dairy processing plant. Our next question uh, pre-submitted was, uh, what do we know about the safety of properly aged raw milk cheeses? I know from the participant list that we have a number of people who are eager for the information that is forthcoming on that second round of retail uh, product studies. Um, do you have any information that you can share now or when might we know more? So the hope would be in the very near future, future we'll be able to share the results of our second uh, retail sampling survey. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, and again, we did include properly aged raw milk cheeses in that survey. So we should be able to share that very soon. And Dr. Groovy, uh, a probing question offered privately to me in the chat. Uh, was on the same topic. And because it's related, I'm going to jump in with this one now. Um, that is, did FDA check as to when the raw milk cheeses included in that retail study were, were processed? Because of course, uh, a retail cheese may sit on the shelf for a while before it's purchased, particularly one that's a hard cheese. Uh, and of course, all raw milk cheeses that are for sale in retail uh, settings across the country must first be aged those 60 days. So um, was that a consideration as you chose products? So it was cer certainly a consideration. Uh, I don't have in front of me when those cheeses were, were manufactured. And again, when we sent the samples uh, to be tested, all of that information was removed. Uh, because we did not want uh, anyone to feel concerned that the results, uh, if they were included, uh, would reflect negatively on the producer or the processor. And I'm certain that everyone appreciates that consideration as well. Uh, interested in the information because, of course, uh, consumer and employee safety comes first, um, but also interested in continuing business operations. Thank you, Doctor. Our next question uh, offered in advance was, and I do want to remind people that this is the time for you to put those questions in the chat. If you have them for Dr. Ruby, please enter them into the chat um, or as some have done, send them to me or to Grace directly and we'll be happy to ask them on your behalf anonymously. Uh, this question, the FDA has stated clearly that pasteurized dairy products are safe. I think I heard you say that four times during your um, presentation and we sincerely appreciate that. Has the FDA weighed in on thermization, essentially a lower heat treatment as a way to inactivate H5N1? Only four times. I'm slipping. It should be mm -hmm. more than that. So we have <laughs> uh, started looking at thermization. Uh, that's one of the, the parameters we're going to be looking at in our ongoing or future planned uh, research studies, because we do want to understand the different time temperature combinations that H5N1 will be sensitive to. The goal is to, to develop a curve that we can use to gauge whether a, process, a product should be safe or should should present a potential risk. And a related question on that front. Do you have uh, trusted resources from industry that you can call on for support? 
in offering some of those products that are treated with a, a lower um, heat level. Well, first we have to understand what the heat level is that is safe. And so first we have to establish those parameters. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, the question that I received was basically offering assistance. <laughs> so just know that we're here to partner with you and happy to provide uh, materials and insights on how, how some of these products are made as well. Uh, of course, you know much of this, but um, sometimes it's helpful to have folks in industry as well. Absolutely. Our next our next question, uh, and I believe this is the last pre-submitted question, everyone. So final call, uh, make sure that you enter your questions in the chat now. Has FDA considered any communications campaigns around the message that pasteurized milk and dairy products are safe? We saw ads during the pandemic encouraging vaccination. Perhaps the same strategy could be helpful. Any thoughts on that, doctor? Uh, love that suggestion. Uh, we certainly want to get the message out there that pasteurized milk products are safe. Uh, you know, as I said, only four times in this presentation means I'm slipping. We, we try to say it multiple times every time we have a public or, or government engagement with our partners. We really need to get that message out there. And I love the idea of an ad campaign. Okay, that's great. Uh, a question uh, in the chat, um, have there been any inoculation studies done where you make raw milk cheese with inoculated milk? Have not been completed yet. That is one of our planned research projects is to understand when we take unpasteurized milk, inoculate it with H5N1, and then put it through a variety of different cheese making processes. As you can understand, you know, salts, you know, salt temperature, pH, all those things will affect, are expected to affect the viability of H5N1. Uh, but how much and, and what it conditions, that's what the research project is, is designed to, to answer. And to that point too, I would say to the, the, the person that asked this question, please know that um, WCMA engages in a weekly phone call with um, involved researchers. And to, to my knowledge, um, of course, Dr. Gruby knows, what he, <laughs> knows what's happening with this, but to my knowledge, um, we're still at a stage where they're talking through the strategies for how appropriate inoculation would be done, the right kind of um, uh, studies that could be done that would be reflective really of what a consumer could end up with. Um, obviously, there's lots of different ways to study something. And they're being very careful and I think um, considerate of uh, the potential results on, and the impact on industry. So we really appreciate the spirit of partnership that researchers at the Center for Dairy Research, uh, at Cornell, um, a variety of institutions are showing uh, our industry, understanding how sensitive the, the topic will be. Our, uh, our next question from the chat, uh, Dr. Gruby, <laughs> a very direct one. Uh, when will the study on inactive, in, inactivation curves uh, be completed? Do not have an answer for that at this time. Uh, has not yet begun, so I can't say what's gonna finish. Okay. Um, and then finally, kind of an interesting, um, maybe it's, uh, it's adjacent our industry certainly, but we had a question uh, from a participant, uh, we see a lot of focus on uh, the safety of pasteurized milk. What about eggs? We haven't heard much uh, on, on that in eggs. Is, are eggs uh, less dangerous than, let's say, uh, raw milk? So eggs, you mean, what? what there are Meaning, I think farm the question was farm fresh eggs uh, haven't been discussed, uh, but I certainly see a lot in the news about raw milk. Um, I did a quick uh, search myself on this. And uh, again, there there is guidance that you need to cook your eggs properly to inactivate any a virus. Uh, any other insights on that, Dr. Gruby? Sure, so shell eggs are safe. Uh, so birds that are inf effect, infected with H5N1, they stop laying. Uh, it's one of the early signs that people will see with a, an infected flock is that the egg layers just stop laying. Uh, second, the egg process any farm that's affected by H5N1, if the eggs are, are on property, there are procedures to make sure those eggs don't make it off property. So there's a whole variety of systems in place to make sure that H5N1 infected eggs do not reach retail. All right, uh, that's great. Um, and then doctor, I have one, one final question that I'm aware of right now in the chat, and that is, um, 
when you put out messaging around 20% of retail milk containing virus, how can we better deliver a message to consumers that they are safe? Uh, the fear there is that people only hear half the message. That's always a concern, right, doctor? It's always a concern that, that the message you're, you're conveying is not the one that people hear. And as happened in this case. So again, the 20% number was from five states, uh, sorry, from, from the 32 states that were processing. We don't know how many states produced the milk. The message that we need to get across is that yes, 20% of the, the samples tested positive for HIV-1, none of it had live virus. That is the message you need to be getting across. Just like with, with other pathogen, pathogens, pasteurization works. We don't test other, other samples for things that should be killed off during pasteurization of retail milk. We're doing this because we wanted to prove pasteurization works against H5N1. We know pasteurization works against Listeria, E. coli, Salmonella, the list goes on and on. It's the whole reason we started pasteurizing in the first place. We had to prove that it worked against H5N1. And yet, yes, 20% of the samples that were tested in this small survey were positive. None of them had live virus. So that was the message. Yes, there was an outbreak. There is an outbreak, but pasteurization works against this virus. And that's the message we need to keep getting across. No matter how many positives we get in the second round, pasteurization works. All right, uh, one more coming in, right? I think that you're getting people's wheels turning here. Good. Um, this person, lovely, apologized, saying I should have pre-submitted this one because it might require some thinking, but I believe that you're a person who thinks on the spot too. Um, our European counterparts have been dealing with H5N1 perhaps longer than we have. Are there any key learnings from their experience? So our, our partners have certainly been dealing with H5N1 for, for far longer than we have, they, but they've not been dealing with it in cattle. So unfortunately, we are the, uh, the object lesson for the world. Uh, people are going to learn from what we do right and what mistakes we make. So let's try to make as few as we can. What we've learned from them is effective measures for controlling H5N1 in poultry, but we knew those. USDA has had a long, long history of dealing with H5N1 in poultry, and they didn't have much that they didn't already know, uh, thankfully. So there's not a lot more to learn in the poultry space that USDA doesn't know but nobody knew how to deal with it in cattle. And so our, our EU partners are working closely with us. We're working with partners around the world to make sure that the lessons we do learn and are learning quickly are being shared in case other people find themselves in the same place. Oh, it's never fun to be the guinea pig, is it? No, um, mm -hmm. but uh, hopefully they've, they've gotten the jump on some uh, vaccinations for animals too. So I guess maybe we're all doing our part. When you say uh, one health, one world as well, right? Uh, at least as it relates to bird flu. Um, another question here, uh, the vaccine was uh, the key to getting us out of the pandemic. Uh, do you, can you share any information about the timetable for a human vaccine on H5N1? Perhaps this is too soon to ask that question, but they asked the question nonetheless. It is too soon and the wrong agency. I would refer the questions about the vaccine to ASPR and to CDC. All right. We will check back in with them. I see some of our friends from CDC uh, in the participant list as well, and we'll follow up with them. We'll follow up with all of you. And that brings us uh, to the close of our program here. I want to thank uh, Dr. Stephen Gruby for his uh, time and insights uh, as to the safety of our milk supply and ways that we can be partnering uh, with our federal agency uh, leaders uh, to, to maintain safety for employees for consumers um, and for animals across the United States. We appreciate the important work that you do, doctor, and that your team does as well. They've been wonderful to work with and we'll look forward to continuing to communicate with them as we move forward. Uh, Grace, I'll pass it back to you for some closing thoughts. Thanks, Rebecca, and thank you again, Dr. Gruby, for your time today and your expertise. That was a fascinating, uh, fascinating presentation and, and lots of wonderful questions there. So thank you all for submitting those as well. want to remind you that uh, WCMA will be hosting a workshop uh, virtually and in person next Tuesday, August 13th, 10.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. We'll be talking about enhancing on-farm biosecurity practices amid H5N1. 
uh, amid some news reports just coming out today that uh, it's possible that cases are being underreported among dairy farm workers. This topic is truly more important than ever. So we want to make sure that we're here for you, providing the resources, the tools, strategies, hands-on exercises you need to be able to enhance your on-farm biosecurity practices. Uh, registration for this is, a, is available right now on whizcheesemakers.org. You can see the URL there. We'll also include a link to register for this workshop in our follow-up email. It is free to attend online and just $25 in person here in our offices in Madison, Wisconsin, if you'd like to attend that way. A reminder, finally, for everyone that a recording of this presentation, as well as the PowerPoint that we use today, and a list of key contacts and resources will be shared with all registrants via email by the end of this week uh, after this webinar concludes. So please watch for that email from me. Thank you again so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Have a wonderful afternoon.